Where are we and what is this place, Brown? Oh, this is the College of Complexes that didn't you know? Ken knows very well. In fact, he brought uh, his little camera here. He is uh, recording this for posterity. And if you want uh, to find out uh, anything about it, uh, you just ask him, and yeah, if you need uh, not to be photographed or something, tell him that too. Uh, the uh, schedule of uh, our future uh, meetings is uh, on this uh, freebie. Up here on the table, if you don't already have it. Uh, let's see. What time is it? What else can I tell you? Oh, this topic tonight, the Cold Case Files Organization. Uh, they aim uh, to assist law enforcement in resolving unsolved or misresolved cases such as homicides and child abductions. So we have a lot to talk about tonight. Uh, without any further ado, then. Let's hear from our speaker, Ish Finister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am so excited to be here tonight. Um, I have my dad here with me, and I have a great deal of respect and love for him. And for him to be here tonight is the greatest thing uh, a father can do for his son. And I'm very excited to be here at the college a complex. I did a little research on this place, and uh, they say you guys have been doing this since 1951. Yeah. And that means a lot of great people have stood right here. A lot of great minds have said a lot of great things right here, so I feel like I am on the right track. I, today is a very special day for the organization. It's a very special day for me. Um, this is our first exposure to the public. So I think that's a birthday. So I'll forever remember this date, uh, forever. Uh, we're a new organization, so today I'm, I'm going to be uh, short. I'm not going to keep you here too long. I'm just going to go over uh, our vision and our cause. And without further ado, we're going to go into it. Well, first, Cold Case Files organization is organized exclusively for charity and educational purposes within the means of the Section 5013. Uh, we are a new non-for-profit, I call it the seed stage. Uh, we're looking to be funded by grants and charitable donations by individuals and foundations and corporations and by the government uh, uh, for, for funds that's only available for uh, non-for-profit organizations. Now our mission, the mission of Cold Case Law Organization is, is to be a service to the victims of violent crime. And we support forensic science in the medical examiner's offices, and we encourage law enforcement in pursuing or, or revisiting cold cases, and emphasize the importance of, of the community's help in solving cold cases. And our purpose is to raise public awareness to the unsolved crime issues in Chicago, as well as across the country, such as homicides and serial murders, very painful one child homicide, rape, mysterious disappearances, parental abduction, uh, and the investigation into uh, wrongful convictions. We offer advocacy assistance to victims, victims' families, witnesses, by providing services and support in the education of their rights. Very important, we're, we're strongly committed to our cause in educating ourselves so that we can be truly effective in Chicago's community. And CCFF is composed of, of a professional staff. We're all experienced and trained uh, to work with the public as advocators. And each one of our board of directors, they must complete the Illinois Victim uh, Assistant Academy. It's a 40 hour uh, extensive course uh, for crime victim providers and law enforcement agencies. The focus is of the organization is the victims, the survivors, and the witnesses, and forensic science. And I know you're thinking forensic science, but we're going to get into that. And I may surprise you with uh, a couple of things about America's medical examiner's offices. 
Well, first I'm going to start with the, the victims project because the victims are the most important to me. I myself uh, have been a victim in my life. So this is where a lot of this uh, passion comes from. We created a program called the Progress Program. And this program of interventions and activities were designed by victims that have successfully overcame the experience of a crime. And together we composed uh, ways, effective ways to help, assist, and guide, and advocate so that one can retain, maintain in their overall wellness and safety. And the goals of this program is to educate and to guide the victims and their families towards recovery, the immediate recovery, and the long-term recovery process. Our services, it's, it's to aid the victims of the, of the violent crime, show support or assistance to whom uh, may uh, not otherwise could afford it or someone who has taken incredible loss uh, during the crime. So what we want to do for, for our victims is, is offer emergency financial support for expenses, you know, occurred during that violent crime. Uh, the referrals are, are made for vital services like rent or hotel or travel or food. And for the witnesses or the victims that may need help with employment, we want to be there for them, create free resumes and cover letters, get them back on their feet, free voicemail box, uh, job references and referrals, and again, very important, a homicide support group so we can get together each month and talk about the future. This last one here, I think this, this last call, it was the first. Uh, idea I have for this corporation because again this is this cause is very dear to me and I'm sure it's dear to us all a no child forgotten program it's a toy drive and it's for children that has lost their parents or parents uh, from the ages of 0 to 18 we want to follow those kids and if they're enrolled in our program we'll have toys donated to us and we'll be there uh, to deliver on birthdays and Christmas and their graduations as long as we're a positive influence in this kid's life, we just want to remind them that what happened was wrong. And there's nothing we can do about it. All we can do is look for the future and support each other. And I think a lot of children uh, that, 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 that will receive that kind of support, maybe they won't grow up to be criminals or try to get back. You know, it's, it's really hard on the children. And I'm going to move on because I could talk forever about the kids. I, I, I have two that I, I love very dearly. In servicing the victim, this is our highest priority. It's our, it's our most important obligation. And we work as chaperones to anyone having problems with difficulty uh, coping with the effects of a violent crime. And by joining uh, alliances with other organizations, we can provide victim resources. Uh, I, I, I was going to go through all these, but I'm not. I'm going to keep it brief. But some victims don't know that there is uh, crime victim assistance by the government. They can go there and, and the government would help them recover. The Angel uh, Court Group, uh, they help uh, victims uh, with any kind of uh, legal uh, paperwork. and They help them get through the process if, if, if they're a, a witness to the crime. The angels' food, that's another great one because a lot of parents uh, may be going through a hard time out there and they may not know that they can get reduced groceries. Uh, I believe it's like $85 worth of groceries for $40. Um, that could feed a family. And this last one here is dear to me and, and my father, uh, parents of murdered children. Um, I, I, I could not imagine how that must feel to lose your child, to, to die before your child. And there's an organization, this organization, they're out in the suburbs. I talked to them, they're planning on moving to Chicago. And they get together with these parents and they talk. And I think that's very important uh, to have a, a place that you can go and talk with other people that experience the same thing you have. I hope I'm not moving too fast. This is my first. <laughs> Now this, this is, I added this in there, you know, these services apply to individuals who, who qualify for services using the, the advocate's minimum qualification system based on a variety of factors including their income and, and the type of litigation they're being sought, but that statement does not apply for a cold case file organization. We will support and help any victim that is exposed to us. We 
want to raise reward money. Make it an incentive for the community. We want to emphasize the importance of the community. In some communities, it's not cool to help solve a violent crime. So maybe on top of the reward money that's given by the state, a cold case files can offer a little extra incentive for those people to come in. We're going to leave our phone lines open 24-7, a confidential phone hotline. And this service will be used to help, to help uh, callers that may be in danger or need assistance. And the callers may also leave information about unsolved crimes. And I had to put this last one here because confidentiality is our core commitment. And all of our communications and our contacts and interactions are consistent with this statement. Uh, we will only release information with the explicit authorization of our participants. That's important. You have to be able to trust. I heard you mention uh, neighborhood watches. We want to use social media to connect neighborhood watches. If you know what's going on in your neighborhood, and we join together, we can know what's going on in the city. We want to alert the public when the community's help is needed. Coordinate search parties for missing person. Again, using Facebook and Twitter and text messages, emails uh, to our, our members and our volunteers to gather if need for, uh, to help with a search party for a missing person. We want to have our newsletter out each month and open up our website to allow visitors to come and post information about cold cases. I always leave the best for last. Free, the free fingerprinting kits, ID kits, and DNA. Now, right now, I'm working with a, a company that uh, decided to donate those to us, but I'm, I, I love to tell parents, okay, I'm going to use this for example, and I'm not going to talk much about this story because I don't know much about it that's been in the media, but the three girls that were kidnapped for 10 years. And, and, and what I'm saying is no disrespect to their family. I'm just... If, for me, what I do for my children is I get I, I, I got a little ink pad and I took her fingerprints and I have a copy of it. Um, I, I took a couple Q-tips and I rubbed it against the, her gums and I put it in a Ziploc bag so that you never know. Those girls were missing for 10 years and they weren't always stuck in that house and you never know. There could have been a piece of material processed uh, through the crime lab that would have had their fingerprints on it. And who knows? We, we may could have found those girls earlier if the parents uh, had fingerprints of the child, but parents don't think about that. Um, even when you go to the dentist, pay that extra 20, 30 bucks or whatever to get their dinner records and keep it alongside with their birth certificates and their social security cards. You, 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 doing this isn't wishing bad on yourself, it's just preparing for the world we live in today. Now this is my favorite, forensic science. So when I started this organization, I started getting deep into forensic science. And you can tell that I, 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 I let's move on, let's get, let's get into it, here we go. All right, so over the last two decades, many advances have been made in the field of forensic science, which has led to the prevalence of forensic science in the criminal justice system and the courtrooms. Attorneys, judges, and jurors, they all rely on this ev the evidence presented in the courtroom to determine uh, the guilt of the innocent of the accused and all of the tools provided by science, which play uh, a very important role in the criminal justice system ever since the FBI opened the doors in the 1930s. But for, more, for many people in the public, their understanding of forensic science, it comes from the world of entertainment exclusively. You know, popular TV shows like CSI, NCIS, they give this oppression of forensic science like it's nearly infallible. And it's not only that, but it can be done within minutes, and it's always conclusive, and it's very high tech. But really, if you go visit uh, the Illinois Crime Lab, uh, in reality, the, the crime uh, forensic testing uh, processes are substantially different than what you see on the Hollywood set. You know, most across the country are underfunded and understaffed. So what our organization wants to do is support and identify the unmet needs of the Illinois Forensic Science Crime Laboratories and their medical examiner's offices. We are. We're very aware that many forensic science tests, they lack uh, today uh, the scientific value. And our citizens in our courtrooms and law enforcement personnel, they rely on these tests and it is imperative that we improve the research regarding forensic science. 
and make sure that we know its limitations. And many crime labs are forced to deal with inadequate funding, outdated equipment, and lengthy backlogs. We're going to get back to the backlogs. You'll be surprised about that too. In addition, uh, these labs, uh, they're not required to coordinate their efforts, um, which could undermine Homeland Security. So let's just say, if terrorists, terrorists would attack uh, locations in several states at one time, there would be no guidelines for local uh, crime labs to work together with national homeland security experts to examine the evidence and share their findings. And I find this very unacceptable. The United States should be tough on crime and tough on terror. But our efforts are meaningless if we have shoddy science and, and, and ineffective crime labs hindering our ability to enforce our laws and protect our people. Now this is what makes me, this boils my blood about bad forensic science and its wrongful convictions. And DNA exonerations have grown all across the country in the last recent years. Wrongful convictions have revealed disturbing pictures and trends in our criminal justice system. And together, these cases show how the criminal justice system is broken in places and how urgently it needs to be fixed. Wrongful convictions are caused by a number of factors, all of which can be avoided. The most common is improper eyewitness identifications, bad forensic sciences number two, false confessions, false testimonies from jailhouse snitches or informants, or bad uh, defense lawyering, misconduct by the police or the prosecution, or even a judge just asleep at the switch. And when these causes overlap, and you take a look at any wrongful conviction case and study, you're going to find four or five of these factors in play. And over half of all exonerations, like a little over 50%, the trials were contaminated by bad forensic science, such as microscopic hairs, uh, bite marks, analysts, uh, fibers, soil, voice analysts, uh, and forensic science practice that has not been scientifically or properly tested. And faulty science is at a rampage in, in America's courtrooms. It's procured by prosecutors, often well-meaning, it's tolerated by judges, it's offered by experts, and it's consumed and believed by the jurors in good faith. And every time, every time an innocent person is put behind bars, a guilty person is let free to walk the streets. And the bottom line is that we got to do everything in our power to make sure only sound evidence is used in our criminal justice system. Even the scientific community, they also express serious concern about the quality of our country's crime labs. And I was surprised to discover that there are no national standards for, for, for forensic science labs or the people who work in them. And as Americans, you know, we pride ourselves on having the world's finest, sorry, fairest criminal justice system. But we all heard horror stories about faulty forensic science that has sent people to jail or even worse, to death row. Now this is the Ron story. This is a short story, but I gotta tell you Ron's story. At the time of his trial in 1988, the police, the prosecution, they had virtually no evidence against this guy because he was innocent. And they used a couple of jailhouse snitches, a half-baked jailhouse confession and some science, and they got their conviction. And the most damaging witness in Ron's trial was an expert from the state crime lab who took the stand with a, a great deal of authority and he explained to the jury that there were 17 scalp and pubic, pubic hairs taken from the crime scene. And he used all the right terms. He even said that the hairs were microscopically consistent with the samples taken from Ron. He even went so far as to use the word, we have a match. We got a match. The prosecution picked up on it and they ran with it for the rest of the trial. You know, the experts, they come in, they got education, they got experience, they got the resume, the nice suits, the vocabulary, and they're very, very impressive to the jurors, who, who may not be that sophisticated. 11 years after this guy testified, 11 years, those 17 hairs underwent DNA testing and not a single hair came from Ron Wilson. He got a miracle in 1994. He was working with the Innocence Project in New York. And
and uh, he went under DNA testing, and he was completely exonerated. He he was found not guilty. He walked out of jail in 1999. I gotta say it one more time. Eleven years after his trial, uh, those those hairs were tested, and not one came from him. Uh, it, it's hard to lose a loved one. Just imagine having a loved one in jail for something they didn't do, being tortured every day. That really boils me. So we really need to look closer to our friends. We don't know about this, and we, we watch the television, and we think that forensic science is all this high tech, and the government can get away without funding it. I'm going to kind of go into that. Because unfortunately, it's a national problem. The NAS, the NAS reported you know, significantly that the, the national forensic science system does not sufficiently support education, or training, or certification, uh, and the standards for testing and testifying. Well, there is research that established what needs to be done to improve these various forensic science practices. In fact, uh, there just hasn't been anyone able to uh, sufficiently muster the resource nor the focus or their attention necessary to use the existing information as a, as a launching pad to comprehensively uh, improve the integrity of all forensic science. And for our criminal justice system to work properly, Standards must be developed, quality must be ensured before the evidence can be presented to the court or even before the police can seek to consider the value of such evidence before determining the course of their investigation. I pop this one up. Because if you go on New York Times website and you type in this exoneration key and what happened then, you're going to see a map of all the men that has been exonerated over the last 20 years. Now, Texas was number one. Yeah. It was so many, I stopped counting. Yeah. But Illinois was number two. So I think I'm in the right place to start this. It takes a federal effort. Federal effort is needed to ensure that uh, the best standards and a single standard is implied so that we don't have 50 states working under 50 different definitions of science. And forensic science in America needs one standard. One standard of science so we can have one standard of justice. It's time for a serious commitment to provide scientific uh, systems and support for forensic science in order to ensure the ongoing evaluation and review of current and developing forensic science uh, techniques and technologies and practices and devices. Likewise, we need both public and private industry to support and research uh, and develop uh, uh, an improved technology with the eye uh, towards the future economic investments that both benefit the public uh, good and administer justice. The investment of time, effort, and resources is necessary to deliver us from this false alliance. Uh, some forensic uh, practices, sorry, some forensic practices will pay tremendously. Um, effort and resources, uh, they can't be wasted on this false alliance. In short, uh, it, will, it will make the criminal investigation and the prosecution and the convictions more accurate and our public more safe and perhaps, most importantly, justice more ensured. This can only be done with the efforts uh, of leadership at the most highest power, both federal and state government, they should, they should pursue a national standard uh, and with, you know, significant uh, infusion of, of federal funds. Laboratory accreditations and individual certifications. This is not happening in forensic science in America. Uh, in a lot of counties across the country, if a, if, 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 if a guy is injured, and he wants to move to the forensic science uh, section of, uh, of, of the organization, he doesn't need to have scientific background in order to study this, and I think that that's, that's surprising. I, I couldn't believe it when I looked into this, so let me keep going. Uh, in determining the appropriate standards for accreditation and certification, a National Institute of Forensic Science should take into account and establish and recognize international standards, such as the one published in the International Organization of Standardization. Sorry, standardization. 
Uh, no person, public or private, should be allowed to practice in forensic science discipline or testify as a forensic science professional without certification. Forensic science laboratories should establish routine quality assurance and quality and control uh, procedures to ensure that the accuracy of forensic analysts and the work of the, the, the forensic practitioners. Um, quality control procedures should be des designed to identify mistakes and fraud or bias and confirm that there is a continued value and reliability of the standard operation of procedures and protocols. And this will ensure that the best practices are being followed and the correct uh, uh, procedures and protocols that are found to need improvement are improved. The National Institution of Forensic Science and their advisory board should establish a national code of ethics for all forensic science disciplines and encourage each state and their counties to incorporate this national code as part of uh, their professional code of conduct. Additionally, you know, the National Institute of Forensic Science should explore enforcing punishment to those forensic scientists who commit serious ethic violations, uh, such as um, such a code should be enforced through the certification process. So let's say, let's say a forensic science um, person, they, they made a mistake. On their next certification, that should be brought up and the National Institute of uh, Forensic Science should question if this person should still be working in this field. Okay. Certification requirements should be included at a minimum uh, written exams, uh, supervised practices, proficiency testing, continuing their education. Even judges should kind of know what's going on in forensic science. When they're listening to the professionals, they should kind of know what the professionals are talking about. And effective disciplinary uh, procedures. In all laboratories and faculties, both public and private, they should be accredited. Believe it or not, they're not. And all forensic science professionals should be certified within a time um, period established by the National Institute of Forensic Science. None of this is happening right now in America. Education. I think education fixed so many problems already in our country that I'm sure it can fix this one. So in my organization, what I want to do is make major emphasis on, on graduate education in forensic sciences. So to attract students to pursue graduate studies in the field uh, critical to forensic science practice, uh, Congress should uh, authorize and appropriate funds to the National Institute of Forensic Science to work with the appropriate organizations and educational institutions to improve and develop uh, graduate education programs appealing to potential students. And they must include attractive scholarship and, fellow, and fellowship offerings. Emphasis should be placed on developing and improving research methods in, in, in involving forensic science practice and on the funding research uh, programs to attract uh, research universities and students in the field relevant to forensic science. So this is our goals. I want to get out there and I, and I want to I want to raise so much awareness. I want to raise so much money that we can select one high school student or one adult student each year to receive a partial or full scholarship into the field of forensic science. Uh, the forensic science school here in Chicago, we got we have three, and the average tuition is about fifteen thousand, and that's for an Illinois resident, and almost close to seventeen thousand for someone who's living outside of the state. And I'm getting that from 2009-2010 uh, school year. And that's not even including the average cost of books and supplies for forensic science students in Chicago. And that's about $1,500. But what's the good thing about that and why we want to invest in the education um, is that the Bureau of Labor Statistics project that a 20% increase in the next six years for the need of forensic scientists. I'm right here at that point. I'm, I'm close to my rack. You say, why cold case files? The city logged its 200 homicide on Saturday, July 6th. Chicago ended 2012 as America's murder capital with 506 slain reported. 
931 was the highest record in 1994. In Cook County, Chicago Police Department reported that in 2012, the murder clearance rate and the terms uh, of an arrest being made within two years of the homicide has dropped from over 70% in 2002 to now 60% in 2012. And here we are halfway through our year. In the summer months, we get significantly higher murder rates. And over 70% of the murders uh, take place between 7 p.m. and 5 a.m. And that's when I spend most of my time outside, so that's scary for me. 15% uh, of murders uh, offenders are between the age of 14 and 16. That surprised me. And black murderization rate is approximately 33 uh, per 100,000. So that means over 33% of the black males that I walk by may be a victim of a crime by the end of this year. And that scares me. Backlog. I, I, I was talking to Scott uh, Goodrich from Cook County uh, Police Department. And he brought something to my attention that just broke my heart. Backlog. 80% of rape kits go untested in Illinois. 80% of rape kits go untested in Illinois. When a woman is raped, she's brought to the hospital and they take her through a very gruesome uh, violation and she, she's almost being violated again for that information that they have to distract from her body. And instead of them taking it to the crime laboratory and actually processing it, it sits. There are an estimate 400,000 unprocessed rape kits currently backlogged in the United States. And the one major uh, reason for this backlog is, is a lack of funding for local police. And Democrats and Republicans, they have identified a serious problem and the need to come together to find a solution for this growing rape kit backlog issue. In 2012, a bill was introduced before Congress that would allow local law enforcement to apply for the funds they say they need to test heavy rape kits. But this bill has not yet passed. I don't know what they're waiting for. I don't, I don't. In countless cases, lawmakers complain by the time the kits are tested, the statute of limitation has passed and the rapists can no longer be charged. And each number is a real person that has been violated. That gives me chills to imagine a woman going through that in her state who not process the kit. You should look into this. This, this is a true thing. I get here and I, and I made this say awakening because that's how I feel when I, when I read this. I feel like I'm, an, I'm awakening. I'm like, wow. I mean, I, did, I, I really thought it's like CSI Miami and, and these people are, you know, he, he says, I need the fingerprints, and they call him back in five minutes by the time he gets to the scene, and it belongs to this guy. That's not what's happening out there in our criminal justice system. So for 2013, Cold Case Files organization, we're going to be refining and strategizing on new ways to improve our current programs. Also, build up structure and procedures. We are attempting to reach new volunteers and staff to add new skills and knowledge to develop current effective ways to combat crime. And our objectives for the first three years is to create a service-based organization whose primary goal is to exceed in building alliance uh, with Chicago's communities in which they can rely on us for victim advocacy and the education of their rights. And when we're done, come 2014, we're going to present all of our findings uh, to the Committee of Commerce, Science, and Transportation at the U.S. State Senate. We, we, we got to do it. So we're going to we're going to do all those the average, you know, those those fundraising ideas. We're, we're going to have our website uh, open to accept donations. We're going to sell services, clothes, books, apparels, uh, sending emails out and newsletters for donations, uh, renting space, uh, selling advertising on our websites holding auctions, fundraising, you know, direct mail, charities. The last one here is what I really, really am excited for is the dinner events that we want to raise um, uh, 
uh, to help us raise funds to keep our cause going and to be a part of Chicago's black party. We need resources, revenues, and contributions um, to allow us to effectively uh, change our communities. And all donations made by individuals and foundations and corporations are tax exempt and tax deductible. Uh, we're very excited to, dis to discover the difference that we can make. Uh, there are specific things that we have to do to make these differences. And we have to create alliance and gain information to find support. In order for CCFF to occur, maintain, and, and expand, we have to be profitable. Also, invest in new opportunities. And this is awesome. We're going to run for charity. We're sponsoring one or more athlete to run in the Boston Marathon. I will be there in the crowd. I'm not a runner. But I'm going to make sure that I do my part to make sure the 2014 Boston Marathon is the best, the biggest marathon they've ever had because we cannot allow the beast to think that we're going to back down to Terra. It's not happening. We're also going to be running in the uh, Chicago's uh, Bank of America Marathon uh, of 2014, October 3rd. Now my information, if, if you want to look into a little more about what I was saying to find out, you know, Hey, is this guy serious about this? I got a lot of my uh, information from the attorney, um, the attorney and investigation of science, forensic science. A little bit came out of the red eye, the Huntington Post, and the New York Times. That is it. Because we are a new organization, and I thank you all for being here tonight, and God bless you. Jeff. Yeah, all right. You, when you quoted this expert talk, telling the jury that it was a clear match, do you happen to know, I'm going to a question here, number one, do you happen to know how the defense responded in cross-examination? Uh, such things as, well, what does that mean, and what are your credentials? And B, a larger point of the do you guys consider attempting to educate defense attorneys about these nuances of what sort of qualifications these folks do or don't have compared to what other countries require or whatever the case may be. That's a very good question. Um, what happened in this case wasn't just the most damaging was the state that came in and said that. Somehow there was a uh, a jailhouse snitch that said, hey, he, he, he told me he did it. And when the, the jury heard all that, and they believe in the professional. All right, but I'm talking about the defense attorney. It sounds to me like he dropped the ball. I, I don't, he, he didn't have anything to go for, because they're telling, they, they're, they, they told the jury, all 17 hairs came from that guy. He said, I got a match. Yeah, and how, well, what's your expertise, buddy, that you would know what a match is or isn't? Right, so what, like I was saying, some of these forensic scientists, they're not scientists. They're just a guy that's in the position. It should be uh, certification. And, and didn't the defense, why did the defense attorney think of asking and exposing this? Hey, and, 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 and plus, this was in 1988, so you know, forensic science has came a long way, but these things are going on still today. And that guy that sent him away for 11 years, there was no discipline action taken towards him. He didn't lose a thing. He's still doing his job. Well, what I'm telling you is that defense attorneys have a lot to do with this. They could I, expose I know. holes the size that you could drive a truck. Right. You know, you're right, but 
the jury tends to believe the professional and that nice suit. Well, if they know he's a professional. Right, but they, did, they, they didn't know he wasn't a professional. Okay, well, that's the, the defense attorney's That's job. why we're here. We want to expose those non-professionals that's working in our crime lab that has such a big influence on our criminal justice system. I, I will take that note. You're right. That's John? I think he was next. Here. John, that you was. Well, it's Don. Okay. You were talking about how, um, how you said that you, in reference to, to the rape kits. And, and yes. Reported rapes that the police departments are underfunded. Yes. I've been reading a book, but a couple of different books, actually. One called Drift by Rachel Maddow, and another one called uh, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. The police are getting all kinds of, look, local police departments all over the United States, even places like Elgin and Waukegan, are getting all kinds of money from the feds, especially from the Department of Homeland Security, and they've really beefed up their, their uh, police forces. Have you, you taken know, a trip into the... Uh... The one here in downtown, so what? the medical examiner's oh, office. That, the so these are these uh, are underfunded. South, they, they are underfunded. They're underfunded. Oh, let's not go into. Uh, I and mean, we're not just. I, I, I want to bring attention to the medical examiner's offices, not only just in Illinois. I mean, there's some all over the country that just do not have the right equipment, and they have such outdated equipment. Mm -hmm. that Any, their findings are always inconclusive. Yeah, we, we can't accept that. But my, 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 what I'm saying though is that there's, it's, it's, not, like saying, it's not like there's a shortage of money. I mean, it's, it's all oh it's yeah, you know what it is. You, know, you, you want to know what it is? It's in local cops. It's because we do not know this. We, as I don't know why the public thinks that it's like it is on television. It's not. So the government can get away with not putting those funds directly into where it's needed mm -hmm. because of. Uh, we don't, we're not aware, we're not demanding it. Mm -hmm. That's what this organization is oh. here for, to demand it. And I'm gonna go back there and I'm gonna check into that. Oh, okay. I'm gonna make it my life's work. Okay. Okay, Gene. I think you mentioned that in, in 2012, yes. there was a federal uh, bill that had to do with uh, <coughs> following up on these rape cases. To, to not follow up on them, to allow local law enforcement agencies that say they don't have the resources to process these kids, they can um, reach out to the government and the government say they will provide the funds. But still, it's, we're in the midway of, of 2013 and it still hasn't passed. Is it, do you have the uh, number of the bill and have you con contacted your own a U.S. rep to ask him or her to support that bill. You know, I haven't. So that's something that I'm going to do. I'm you know the number tonight. of the bill. No, not on me right now. I didn't bring it. Okay. But that is some 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 questions tonight. I won't be able to elaborate on because we're such a new company. But we are full of passion, and I love your question because I'm going to have that number to you. And I hope to come back here uh, July 20th, 2014, and I'll. Show you guys what I've been doing all year. Thank you. All right. All right. And uh, let's see. Karina. Karina. Um, in other countries, like um, any country in the European Union um, or in Asia, is there a standard? Uh, is there a UN standard? For yes, there uh, is. It's called the International uh, Standards of Organization, and they they have a great. Um, uh, code of Act is already set in place. We, uh, America already knows what needs to be done. It's up to the people to demand that it's done so we can have a trustworthy, secure justice system. It's, they're not doing it because we're not asking. So is your position that we should create a code or should we just adopt what the existing UN code? Or? I, from the research that I've done on the international standard code seems like it works very well very well very well in their countries so yes let's take a look at it as Americans and if we see something in there we don't like we can move it around but 
Yes, and all it seems like America just will not adopt this. All right, Gene Anderson. Uh, according to your literature here, and I believe you mentioned something verbally yes. about uh, uh, cold, cold case uh, advocacy on the part of your organization. I want to know, you didn't speak too much about it, but I want to know your procedure and how do you go by, for instance, the Chicago Police Department, as far as I can remember, only recently got a formal old case division, or uh, old case uh, investigation for homicide, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I want to know, you were interested in bringing old cases to the police department and those others. Encouraging them. Huh? Encouraging right, them to right. look you, into. But you know what's hard is that there's so many murders that these guys are underfunded. I, I, I believe the responsibility is on our federal government to apply these funds, to hire new people, to, to give students um, an easy way to college, make the scholarships, you know. Right now, if you don't have students wanting to go into the field, and if, if we can get sound forensic science, we can lessen, you know, wrongful convictions and cold cases. I, I want to, I, I believe in a, an America where our criminal justice system can be so strong in the forensic science that we can rely on that it would deter criminals from even committing a crime because they'll be thinking, hey, I, I'm, they're going to catch me. I'm going to leave trace evidence. Uh, my, my question is specific. In, in our uh, village, some information, mm -hmm. I'm a retired violent crime detective of Chicago Police Department. Oh, I really need to talk to you. And, and, and all I'm interested in is the question I'm trying to figure out. I mean, I want you to tell me. You, you, you speak about the cold, cold case. case and so forth. Well, that means you have to go to the police department to get cooperation. Right. Or, and they have to have the, uh, the, the ability to assist you in the OK. And when you do this, how do you do it? You knock on the door or no, you, we, you we, make we, up a, a written uh, a, a proposal? Or how yes, do you do this? We will, we will find these people. We will leave our website open for people to, uh, uh, to leave tips. And we're going to be out there, when I, when I find a victim, I'm not just going to meet them and leave them. I'm going to come back to them and say, have you found something? When maybe the detectives have moved on to another case. We want to stay involved in these cases and, and find and discover as much information. I'm not a private detective, but they're, um, my, my wife, her, uh, her father is an ex-Detroit uh, police officer. He was telling me about... Um, how when he retired, he had a couple cases left over, and he worked those out of his own pocket. I would love to support them, too, you know. Um, I'm just going to do my best to gain as much information and gain the love of the, the communities so that they will uh, help us solve these cases. Uh, Charlie Zadok. Yeah, yes. What if, um, let's say I get tired of listening to some of these guys. Right. And use Jeff's term, I smoke them. Mm -hmm. What is to preclude me from coming to your organization and using you to discredit the evidence against me? I don't really understand your question. I mean, I could, no, I would say I... I Let's mean, say you killed someone and yeah, you came killed, to me for I help. I killed this guy. <laughs> you can't, you can't and then know. I come to you and I say, oh, and I don't know. You, do oh, can you, go to, you give me some emergency money. Me, yeah. See, that, that, that. No, not money. I want, I want assistance to get free. He looks a lot. Well, and, I, <laughs> and that's where the victim resources go yeah, from? I'm, I'm, no, I want to get out of, I want my case revisited. I need help. The Innocence to... Project. The Innocence Project is a is an organization that I've gained alliance with, and if I see anyone after that, that, there's people that actually do that. I, I myself, I'm I'm not there yet. I'm a young corporation, but the Innocence Project. There's one here in Chicago and in uh, New York, and they love working with people like that. They'll take a look at the case. They'll 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 get in contact with their lawyer or their public defender and find out what's really going on there. And if I find out that this guy is innocent, not you that, that really did it. If I find out someone's innocent, 
I'm going to be there at his trial, and I'm going to let the judge know that this guy has support. And we're just going to do our best. And we're, we're going to make sure that that forensic science, if, it, if there is forensic inside of that case, is sound and it has been properly and scientifically processed. And sometimes all the, all the, all the person need a prisoner that's in there and they really did something right, it's going to show. You're going to smell it. And uh, I, I don't know if we can save everybody, but I know there's going to be a lot of people out there is going to need our assistance. So, uh, Doug, thank you. Yeah, would one of the things that your organization do would you compile a database of some of these perpetrators, like DAs and uh, forensic people that don't have accreditation and don't have any legitimacy, and, and all the times they made mistakes, right? There are black marks against them, I, and things can be held against them. They can be held accountable for what they've done. Yeah, I had that in there. Maybe I read through it so fast. I say that they should have to come back and certify over years. And if they have a mark on their on their record of doing something, you know, unethical, that they don't get to uh, uh, to recertify. They don't they don't get certification. Well, the important thing is the people that are accused could use that against them. Right. They don't have to go through the bother of extensive research on their own. It's, it's on your database. It's available to everyone who's accused unjustly. That this guy used bite marks illicitly. Or right. he completely messed up fingerprint identification, like with the Mayfair case. I think it was Mayfair, right? The guy in Oregon it was accused because he had a partial match to, to a terrorist in Spain, and they arrested him. Yes, yeah. yeah, you know, Mayfield. Mayfield. Yeah, sorry. That was uh, yeah. you're good. You're, you're in Mayfield. Mayfield. It's going to take effort from the federal and state government to really move this forward. Yes. All right, you've. Uh, brought down some pretty ambitious plans. A lot of what you're saying is about all over the map. How long has your organization been in existence? What's your primary source of funding? And how do you intend, do you have like a functional board of directors? I know I it's- I do. I have uh, one you, of them here with me now. Can you give us just a little bit of background on how it got started and- Okay. Why you are pur pursuing I, this as a life's work? I, you know, <laughs> it comes from, and this is why you got to know that this is my life's work. I have a beautiful sister named Akiba Tanzania that was murdered in 2006. There was people in the house when she was murdered and they didn't come to her aid. And I looked at myself and I said, would I stand up to the beast? So I made it my life's work to help other girls like her and I will stand up to the beast I will fund this organization through my own pocket and I've had the support of my family and right now, like I said, this is our birthday, so we haven't even solicited for donations yet. It had to grow here first and this is my first time putting it here. Now, are you, uh, have you gotten your 503C status? Yes. Yes. And you've incorporated, do you have a place of business yet or is it just out of your home still? It, I'm still working out of my home and off of the website. But, like I said, as of tomorrow, we're out there now. We're asking for donations, and I believe this cause is, is dear to me, but I think it's dear to everybody. I think I'm going to get some support out here. And if I don't, I'm just going to keep doing it for the rest of my life. That's just it. <laughs> uh, yes, I have a uh, 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 follow-up question. Yeah. Uh, have you considered the possibility well, you know, that there are experts that are paid Coming to court and give false testimony. There's a bunch of books that talk about these guys, their brains for hire. Yeah. This guy is deep. He's deep. <laughs> You're deep. How, how can you tell when somebody just doesn't have accreditation, you know, they're, they're making mistakes, versus somebody that just went out lying to it using right. their so called expert credentials? And, and, and this is what sways the jurors. And just because you're a forensic scientist doesn't mean you're qualified to testify. I'm, well, yeah. I'm talking about some, some scientists right. that are qualified. They've been doing stuff for years, and now the right wing billionaire organizations are paying these people to testify and muddy the waters right. in different yeah. kinds of situations. Yeah. And that's happening in our court system, and that's happening True. with these right wing judges. True. Like I said, it's tolerated by judges and, and procured by attorneys, and you know, it's in, and then believed by the juror. Um, 
We, we have to put a little pressure on the National Institution of Forensic Science, also the federal government, to get this in motion. Are you hearing other people, you know, as you talk to people, are there other people that yes. are there that some of these uh, police go into, they just lie, they don't understand. They're flat out lying. <laughs> oh, no. Hey, no, hey you, 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 you never know, but all I know is if, if we work together as a community to raise awareness against this, because a lot of people, they, they don't know that. They don't know that. When I talked to Scott Goodrich from Cook County, when he told me about the rape kits, I cannot believe it. There's so much going on, and it can all be avoided. It can all be avoided. So we got to raise awareness. I think that is going to be what helps my organization succeed, is that a lot of this information is just not out there, or people are not looking at it, they're looking at too much TV, and not understanding. Could I, just add, could I just add one thing to it? Uh, yes. I'm his father. And I heard the gentleman ask him about the organization, and, and it's getting started. I came to visit him two days ago from the West Coast, and he's been telling me about this organization. And for the first time, I really looked into what he was saying. It was, it was my daughter, his sister that were murdered. She was stabbed 77 times. And I never thought I would be, I would join a club of that level. And it was very trying for the family and very emotional. It was more emotional for him. I was able to make my way through it. And he took that situation and he came up with this organization. And I, didn't know a whole lot about it, no more than he talking to me every couple of months because I live in the West Coast, he lived here. This is my first time visiting the city. But when he told me that he was coming before this group and that he was about to branch off the organization, I wanted to be here with him. Mm -hmm. But tonight, when he came here, and I looked at him and I read deeply, felt, what he's trying to do. He's not trying to correct the whole system. He's trying to improve in every area that he can the system that already exists. Sir? And I told him that I'm going to be one of the members of the Coast Case team in the California area. The people that I know in California, I, I want to be a part, and he's just finding this out now. I feel his conviction so strongly yes, that I'm going to take it back to the West Coast and I want to open a branch under your leadership. And I'm not saying that just for these people. You didn't know I was going to do that. But I feel your so conviction and I am so honored to be a part of it. Okay? So I wanted to say that publicly right here. And I'm going to go back and tell your mom and your sisters that, that I'm a part of Cold Case 5. Okay? All right. And Frank has the next question. Yeah. I wonder if you realize that the magnitude of the thing that you are trying to confront, the corruption that is so profound, uh, jails now are a profit-making enterprise. <laughs> Uh, detention centers also where children, young children are put in there for profit. So the corruption of the system is beyond the level that you are attacking. It's really profound and you couldn't count on our legislators to be honest and try to put the money where it needs to be put. So my question is, do you realize the magnitude of the corruption that this country has fallen into? I do. I do. I, I, I'm sure someone told that to Martin Luther King, too. They said, you know how big this is? And he said, I have a dream. And I do, too. And if I don't get it done in my lifetime, then I hope this organization can grow and grow. And there can be a cold case files, Miami, Oakland. Is the one we're going to open up next, open California, because there's a lot of uh, crime out there, and we need to fight combat. Um, so yeah, I, I know it's big, but I dedicate my life, and if I don't finish, 
I'm going to try to keep this organization open because it's not my organization. It's owned by the people. Good. Right. I enjoy the full right to ask a question. Yes. Uh, the uh, Medill School of Journalism has been responsible for uh, investigating some cold cases oh, yeah. and uh, turning up uh, innocent uh, convicts. Uh, and uh, I understand that they're having some problems continuing with this. And I also would like to know about uh, law schools. Uh, are they uh, pulling for uh, this uh, education of uh, forensic uh, <coughs> uh, witnesses? You know, believe it or not, no. You know, it's not, there's, there's only three schools here in Chicago we can study forensic science. And the government doesn't give, you know, high and attractive scholarships to these students. And, uh, one of those three schools? Uh, you have, um, you have uh, Loyola has one, the uh, uh, IC has one, and there's another one, I believe it's called the Forensic Science uh, School of Chicago. I, I you know, I want. I, I told myself I was going to stick to the calls, but I should have brought all this. Uh, uh, the Forensic Science School of Chicago. No, I don't. So I'm going to need you to give me that one. Thank you. So that I can go and visit them. Because I, you know, I, like I'm telling you. Yes. That's uh, the way the public has found out about uh, so many. Uh, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's, it's happening all over America. I'm not the only one with my eye out because when I when I started getting into this, I knew what I had to do. There's a lot of information out there that has the same uh, the same cause. But no one's actually mustered the attention. No one actually said, hey, you know, I want to raise awareness. Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it to Congress. You know, no one's actually did it that I know of. When I, when I do my Googles, I just don't find much, uh, of, much fight out there for this. And it, it's, it's our criminal justice system. I mean, it can't be broken like this. In order for us to, you know, really have a fair... They are trying. Uh, Peter, uh, well, in your own case, uh, was the person convicted in the. Uh... Yes. Yeah, that scumbag is behind bars. Did not make me happy at all. But they got the right person? Yeah, they got the right person. But that did not help at all. Yeah. Every day I think of my sister. Every day I talk to my mother, and I know she, she cries still. And sometimes she doesn't want to live because of what happened to her daughter. And when your daughter is uh, slaughtered by someone, if someone takes someone's life, it hurts. And there's so many other people just like me. But I, I have successfully overcome it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take all that hate and all that pain, and I'm going to turn it against itself. And I want to teach other young people that they can do the same thing so they, they won't grow up. And maybe I'm, I'm going off too much, but I'm just going to tell you this. When my sister was murdered, you know what was the first thing came to my mind? I want to murder his sister. And I'm not a killer, but I swear I wanted to go and murder his sister. I moved. I got on the plane and I got out of California because I couldn't take it. I said, I'm not going to be in the same jail as this guy that killed my sister. I wouldn't do that to my mother. But I said, I got to do something. And there's other guys out there just looking for something to get involved with, looking for a way to ease that pain and turn that negative energy against itself. So now I fight crime. Why do you think there has been such a propensity of crime, and what would, in, so, your, in your opinion, would be the best way to correct the problem? He said it earlier, and I, I do believe in it, what, what you said before we start talking. It may sound a little, because uh, I know everyone isn't religious anymore, but when they took uh, God out of the schools, I mean, and metal, metal detectors replaced them. Um, right now we're at a... A, a very, very growing time in American society, and it's getting rough now. You see all this is going on in the media? 
But I really think this is the perfect time for an organization like this to start because we're together on this. I'm seeing men half my age that's from different backgrounds as me that agree with the same thing. I've never seen a president stand up before and give such an honest opinion like he did yes. yesterday. So I think we're all, as Americans, uh, on the same page and crime cannot be tolerated or accepted the way it is in our cities. 200 murders. Fourth of July weekend, I was listening to my police scanner. And oh my God, I listen to a police scanner. I, I need to know what's going on in my community. If you would have heard the things that was going down, the, of the Blackhawks celebration that Friday night, I mean, people were setting houses on fire. I mean, missing girls, people walking down the street bleeding, uh, gang fights, uh, shots fired. And, I, and so, some shots got fired, and the lady, she said, Roger 525, report shots fired. They don't use shot fire anymore. They say a loud blast. So the guy wouldn't respond, so she calls another unit. He wasn't. He didn't want to respond. She calls him again. He gets on the horn. He says, no one's there. She says, no, I just got another call. These police officers have to risk their lives and step into a gun battle. Like, I, I want to support them. That's scary. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Any more? Yes, Mark. In other words, what you're really trying to do is make this uh, organization stand out to the general public. You're trying to organize a group right here in the city. Is that what you're Yes, doing? we're going to start here in the city. Chicago is a beautiful city. And like I said, 2012, we were the murder capital. That's embarrassing, you know? And, 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 it, and it was at 506, and right now we're a little over 200. So, I mean, by, by December, we could be back to the murder capital um, of the United States. And so, yes, I do want to uh, have this organization. I, I want to be a, become a, a trusted part of the community so that the community can trust me because they know that I'm not just some guy out here. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm living this. I am a victim. And I, and I, I believe I, I have and I will successfully continue. To combat crime for the rest of my life. That's awesome. So how about we go to Let's see, Charlie? Yeah, yes, I'm a little suspect of people that don't have badges and practice the law. I, I am too. I am too. You know, I was doing research. I was trying to find ways to support some of the off duty police officers. And I got on their websites, and I mean, these guys are like with sunglasses, and they're like, I'll find your wife cheating on you. And it was hard for me to find an honest. You know, off duty detective that was out there, you know, trying to find. And then I don't, I, you know, I don't know. So I said, you know what, I do know. I'm going to stick to what I know, and I know the victims. And I think I know how to help a victim because I am one. So. But I do need the support of Chicago Police Department. I, I need the support of the whole state to accomplish and be successful. Ron, well, how about we go to a bottles? Yeah, unless I see him up. Any more questions? All right, we will go to rebuttals. How many people here have... Let us thank our speaker first. Thank you very much. This is an honor. Thank you. 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 Thank Oh, well, good. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, man, that's sick. Yeah, Google, it's a famous thing. Yeah, U-R-G. U -R -G. C -U -R -G. I got to know about that. It's a million dollars in all cities. Oh, my God. So, let's see. Oh, one, two, three, four, five. Six, what are you seven. talking about? Eight. What are you talking uh, about? Are you going to about five to six minutes, Brom. Five to six. But I don't want to criticize you. Okay, let's get up there. There's an empty mic. Tramek has referred to what he wants. Let's get this stuff out of here. Maybe you call. Maybe 
we're starting the clock now? I'll start the clock upon the utterance of your first word, Jeff. All right, well, let's see. Yeah, hopefully you can please listen to what I'm going to talk about. Oh, you're in line. All right. Okay, when you're ready, Jeff. Yeah. All right, well. All right, the clock. We've had an attendee here for decades named Bill Wentz whose favorite, favorite aphorism, I suppose, is it's not what you expect, it's what you can expect. And I asked you about defense attorneys, because it's worth bearing in mind, everybody, that the American justice system in particular functions, is, is, the essence of it is the adversarial aspect. And the defense that someone's going to get when they're charged with a crime is pretty much only going to be as good as the defense attorney that they've got working for them. And those folks are only going to be as good in the main as the education they get in this kind of stuff. Now, it's been almost 100 years exactly since forensic evidence of the sort that you're talking about here was successfully used to obtain a prosecution, and I'm forgetting if it's it was in if it was in 06 or 08 that the boss of Scotland Yard, a certain Sir Edward Henry, obtained first obtained a conviction in a criminal case using fingerprints. Ironically, you might say I owned his medals and managed to sell them for reasonable profit, but he institutionalized this. It's been almost a hundred years ago. And I have to say I'm sort of taken aback by what I gather to be your drift, that defense attorneys still are not in law school evidently taught the basics of how to go about scrutinizing prosecution experts. You know, you don't have to get a whole course in law school in fingerprints or this or that specialty. But doggone it, I would have thought that in the course of this past century, law schools would have exposed would-be defense attorneys to the idea that the credentials of a purported expert witness would be material to the defense of their client. And in a sense, this, one of the point I just made, relates to a broader point pertinent to your answer to the question about why is there so much crime and you said something about religion in schools. Well, I suggest to you, I suggest to you that there is another factor which certainly in my judgment dwarfs the significance of what you just referred to. Namely, in American society, the performance of the institutions in general, not only defense attorneys, but all sorts of institutions, is not being inspected to the degree that the likes of Bill Went thinks they should and thinks they can be subject to scrutiny. And I would go further and suggest that there's been a substantial decline in the propensity of these institutions to undergo this kind of inspection, partly because of changes in communications technology. It's clear, but in any case, and I'll get to that in a minute, depending on what time I have left, but it just seems clearer and clearer that the elites, virtually across the board in this society, just see themselves, in effect, as uh, getting a free ride. And this is certainly true of folks on Wall Street. They might be the most notorious bunch of, of elites in this regard, but the mainstream media Certainly, they 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 can they, they can hardly get a story right to save their life. Aside aside from the bare facts, okay, Jack Kennedy was blown away on 22 November 1963. Yeah, they can get that right, but that's about it. Once you started getting into the whys and then so on of things like that, they just seem to have a hell of a time. And maybe it's because they don't care, and maybe it's because they can know they can get away with not care. He's listening to the rebuttals. So yeah, it might be, you know something, it might be a thought, Mike, 
I'd like to have, how about if you guys talk about stuff like that later while I'm giving a rebuttal. Okay. Thank you. So, and I would go, I would tend to suggest that the media has gotten as bad as, as it's gotten, largely because of the influence of TV and radio. Now that's a speech in itself, but I will recommend to you a book, in particular one chapter. The name of the book is Voltaire's Bastards, <laughs> all right, by a certain John Ralston Saul. And the second to last chapter in that book is called The Faithful Witness. And what he means by the faithful witness is the whistleblower. And what is, he argues that what has happened, that thanks to TV and radio and government involvement in all of those things, the whistleblowers are being intimidated implicitly. It's just a lot more dangerous, problematic, for whistleblowers to step forward and blow whistles on, among others, the John Burgess of the world. And so you end up with a whole bunch of folks laying in the tall grass. Every now and then, a, a guy like Manning or who's the now, who's Snowden? Edward Snowden. Guys, guys like that, you know, but they're going to be the exception rather than the rule. And almost to a man, the punditocracy in the American media, especially on radio and TV, okay, tee yeah. off on those guys. Okay, I'm told my time is up, but hopefully that'll give you something to go with. So broaden your perspective. Okay, uh, thank the speaker. Uh, was an interesting uh, talk and uh, exposed a couple of things. Uh, uh, to me, this is uh, besides the part about self-interest uh, that the uh, obviously the speaker's interest is in his own uh, sister who was murdered. But the big issue to me is injustice. And uh, I think Don mentioned the uh, book, The New Jim Crow, by Michelle Alexander. Uh, and uh, that book talks about some of the uh, problems with our crime system. And I would just mention the two things that are obvious here. That is gender and race. Gender and race. Yeah, there are a lot of white males my age who get killed here and there. But uh, as the speaker mentioned, 80% of the, the rapes, uh, the information is not processed. And as Don mentioned, hey, the police got a hell of a lot of money. They don't, it's not a matter of money. It's a matter of how that particular money is used. Uh, I think we have to uh, think about that. Another factor is with the speaker, it was really interesting when I asked my question. He didn't know the n number of that bill. That's crucial to me. And he didn't, apparently hadn't talked to his U.S. rep and apparently doesn't know who he or she is. Because what went through my mind immediately is, Wow, Jan Schakowsky, the representative where I live, would be really interested in this. She is a woman, and 80% of the women who are raped, are, this material is not processed. Uh, I, I think I'll look around for that bill. Maybe I'll call Jan Schakowsky's uh, office and find that out. And I think it would be instructive for the uh, speaker to uh, find out who his U.S. rep is and go tell that person the story he just told us, or a couple stories he just told us. Maybe that rep would uh, see what happened to that bill, and maybe, maybe not, that bill might go through. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I, uh, I very much appreciate what our speaker said tonight, uh, and I like what he's doing. Uh, uh, however, I, um, I want to mention that, you know, we have people like uh, 
John Wayne Gacy, and God knows how many more people he killed than just the ones we know about. I think an organization like this would be able to delve into that and maybe uh, find others. There are people who have missing children that that are believed to have been victims of John Wayne Gacy, but there's never been any proof. People like Ted Bundy and Richard Speck and so forth. We, we need an organization like this very, very badly. But I want to caution our speaker very strongly that I think it would be a better idea for you to seek funding from private organizations, from individual donations and so forth, and not to look to government for funding. Because when the government, because the one who pays the fiddler calls the tune. And dealing with the amount of corruption we have in government today, that when there is somebody who is being investigated or whatever, and our speaker's organization gets involved in it, and the government doesn't want that person bothered because that uh, of power and influence in one thing and another, and they tell you, uh, you better just drop this on this one. After all, we give you $180,000 a year in funding or whatever, so it would be a good idea for you to go along with us. You wouldn't want to jeopardize that now, would you, Ish? So you see, the thing is that that uh, it's best not to have government involved in it uh, in a way where they have control. And when they start putting money in it, they start looking for control. And that would be detrimental to your organization. Uh, we, we need a... Uh, I, I don't have to mention a name like John Burge, uh, who tortured and had other police torture uh, uh, black men into confessing to crimes, and they sat on death row for many years. Uh, and uh, I'd like to mention there was a black man I read about, uh, I think he lived in Hyde Park, and. There, there was a crime committed in the parking garage of a building there, and the man was grabbed, and he did something like 15 or 20 years in prison until they finally proved beyond any doubt that he was absolutely innocent because that they, they did that with DNA. And then they did get the real guy. So uh, these kinds of things can happen all the time. But the more independent that you can stay, the, at least from government, I'm not saying you shouldn't work in cooperation with government, because they have many files and things that you can, that may be placed at your disposal. But when you take their money, you jeopardize. And eventually they may then take over your organization altogether, and then it just becomes another corrupt arm of government. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Andy, you're up. You're on the clock. Uh, six minutes. What do we got? Six minutes? Yeah. Hello. They said, uh, my name is L.P. Anderson. I run a, a database translation service. For those of you, there has been some confusion here in uh, past presentations where some of you have expressed the view that I'm standing up here giving you unwarranted opinions. Um, if I gave you the opinion that uh, there's thousands of scientists saying that asbestos dust, breathing it is a health hazard, that's not my opinion, that's a summary of a massive database. There's tons of books that summarize various subjects and a lot of evidence out there that is not reported by the mainstream press. 
the one single thing you need to talk, uh, be aware of is that our mainstream press runs coordinated blackouts on certain subjects. They will promote a myth. It's a two-pronged process. They promote a myth and they black out the pertinent evidence, the real world evidence that would give people an idea of what really happened on a variety of subjects. And in the last week, uh, we have been treated to a massive media campaign in this country to convict Trayvon Martin while making it look like uh, Zimmerman had a legitimate <coughs> reason to go execute this man. And if you start with square one facts, uh, I'm a volunteer coach for Science Olympiad for 7th graders, 7th, 6th, 7th, 8th grade. We teach students with trying to solve problems. In order to solve any problem, you have to first correctly identify the problem, and then you can correctly identify the solution. And we, we tell our students, if you're stumped with something, go back to square one. Start with what you know to be absolutely true and work from there and build on that. The first fact that everybody agrees on, whether it was in the media or not, is that George Zimmerman was told to stay in his car. He took his weapon, left his car, and ran after Trayvon Martin and executed him. A seventh grader can understand that. Uh, now, the media is trying to make it, a, a, they're, they're trying to build a groundwork for the new right-wing standard ground laws that are being introduced in states with right-wing governors so that as Tom Hartman put it, uh, we can just have have slave patrols again in our cities like they were, you know, 150 years ago or whatever. He said modern slave patrols are, now they're called neighborhood watches. And these laws need to be overturned and challenged or we'll have people just running out of their car with a weapon running after somebody and say, well, that guy threatened me so I killed him. That's exactly what happened in the trial and also uh, you need to look at the prosecutor and the judge in that case because when, when you have, have somebody standing in a blizzard of facts claiming they can't see a single snowflake, there's a problem. It's not that they don't understand, it's that they're paid, as uh, was it Sinclair Lewis that said in 1935, you, you cannot make a man understand a fact if his salary depends on him not understanding it. Uh, the Chinese say uh, you cannot wake up a person who is pretending to be asleep. So we, we have to separate. We have to learn to separate people from saying, well, I can't understand those facts from being in the category of uh, some billionaire is paying them through an organization to promote this false idea on a variety of things. So I say, I'll just run through this list really quick. The first fact is that George Zimmerman just got out of his car, took his weapon, went after that boy and killed him. The second fact that has not been widely reported other than in ABC's news down in Florida, they have film from George Zimmerman being taken into the police department right after the murder happened. There's film showing his front, top, and back of his head, no blood on his clothes. The early film showed that George Zimmerman didn't have any injuries or any uh, bloody nose or anything. That occurred after he got to the police station when somebody figured out that he was going to need a better story if he was going to beat the rap on just assassinating this boy. President Obama is getting all kinds of flack for standing up saying, you don't understand. If you're not a black person, you don't understand what it's like to be followed wherever you go in this country by nervous people that think uh, in an elevator maybe uh, the man's going to steal your purse or something if you're a woman. Uh, you know, uh, Caucasian people can't understand this because we, it's not part of our culture growing up. But it is with African Americans, right? All of these murders and uh, the, unsolved, the, the culture of rape, violence, um, I've read a lot of books over the last five years. Tom Hartman, the historian, talks about this a lot. He said, as inequality goes up in a country, you get increasing levels of violence. The levels of violence in America is, are increasingly related to the growing gap between the billionaires at the top, the inequality in, in this country, and uh, people at the bottom that are struggling for survival because they have no jobs. So when you have no job, you're homeless or nearing homeless, 
uh, it's perceived that the only way you can make money to even pay rent is to be a drug dealer. Well, that's a whole different culture than what they have in European countries all over the world. The middle class in America, especially people of color, have been solidly under attack by right-wing billionaires since 1980. The middle class is being eliminated in America. The goal is to get rid of the middle class. Am I correct? Yeah, and uh, this is another thing that is just completely blacked out by the American media. We're we're under attack by a group of give me another, another minute. Uh, another we're under attack by a group of right wing billionaire sociopaths that control and own the mainstream media. So they shape and mold public opinion every day, uh, and they don't talk about certain reality. We've just come through eight years. We have this country lived through the eight years of the most successful corporate criminal crime crime spree that's ever been recorded in human history, and that that was the lawlessness of the Bush Cheney administration. Eight solid years of criminals running wild, and they see no evidence, uh, no reason not to keep doing it. Uh, the last point I make: getting forensic evidence to our representatives doesn't mean they're going to take action if they're getting paid by billionaires to ignore certain problems. The, the, your organization, I would highly support it. I'll support it myself financially. Uh, it, it's going to happen from the ground up. You need, uh, like, uh, you know, Martin Luther King was getting a lot of people uh, through education, the basic facts, what's going on. And that's, uh, that's how it's going to happen. Progress moves forward in the direction of truth. When enough people reach the point where they say, this is unacceptable, we're not going to tolerate it anymore, then we'll get change. And we, we've gotten change, beneficial change on a variety of subjects, and I think yours is a great step forward. So thank you for the presentation tonight. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, I thought this was a really good, uh, really good presentation tonight, and I think you, it sounds like your organization is doing a lot of, doing a lot of good, and uh, and and I definitely, uh, you know, I definitely agree with what you're doing. Um, the only, the only area where I would, um, that I would take issue with was when you were, uh, was when Tim asked you, um, you know, what you thought was the cause of high crime. I mean, that's, you know, now that's that's a complicated issue. It's hard to say, but. The, 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 you, you said that you think it's because they took God out of the schools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, if God exists, I don't think that human beings can take him out of anywhere. Because he's, if he exists, he's everywhere, he's, he's every, or he's wherever he wants to be, you know. Now, second point I would make is that there are countries that are, if, if it's a question, if, if being less religious makes, makes people more prone to commit to rob, rape, and murder, um, or makes a society uh, more, you know, more ridden with violent crime. Well, there are countries that are more secular than the United States, yet have less crime, such as Sweden, and the United Kingdom, Japan, etc. And on the other hand, there are countries that are more religious than the United States, and at the same time also have a higher rate of violent crime, such as Mexico, uh, South Africa, Brazil. Um, and then on the other hand, there are countries where there's um, where people are less religious than, than Americans, and then there's more crime, like Russia today, for example. Um, so I don't. There really isn't any correlation between how religious a society is and and how much how much crime there is. Now, uh, Andy was talking about the the, the recent uh, trial of Trayvon Martin. Excuse me, the trial of George Zimmerman. They kind of ended up putting Trayvon Martin on trial, but that's another story. Uh, I don't. Okay, the word execution isn't really in a, 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 the right word to use in this case, Andy, because an execution is when when the state uh, when the state kills somebody through a, some a kind of judicial process. And uh, George Zimmerman was was you know that obviously does not apply in the case of George Zimmerman. Second, right. Well, okay. Well, that's that's another question: is whether you know it was definitely a homicide. Whether it counts as murder is another question. The second point I would want to make is about the neighborhood watch. That the neighborhood watch did not uh, endorse does not endorse what George Zimmerman did. It's my understanding from from what I've been reading. I'm not a member of the neighborhood watch, but my understanding is that first of all, they explicitly advise their members uh, not to do what Zimmerman did. That is to carry a gun and or uh, pursue a suspect. Uh, they advise them to you know keep your eyes open and, and call the police if you see trouble or call 911. 
Um, and as a matter of fact, after this whole thing, uh, okay, after George Zimmerman got arrested, or at least after the controversy arose, the neighborhood watch kind of put some distance between themselves and Zimmerman, saying that um, you know that they don't they don't endorse what he did, and they, they made a public statement to that effect. Uh, but overall, I thought that the presentation was very good, and I and I uh, and, and and I agree with what you're trying to do. Yeah, uh, I can share your feeling with the being a victim of homicide, your family, a sister murdered, uh, uh, uncle, two uncles murdered, uh, a brother shot, 40 years later he died, so he probably died from that and so forth. So, now, uh, Thank you. I, I can uh, appreciate the young man here. The young man is trying to do something about what he sees. He acted as an individual. And from his speech, he's intelligent enough to be an individual. He doesn't have to follow somebody else. He don't have to let other people do his own thing. However, I wouldn't tra tra trade places for, for trade places with him. And the reason why is that show me a problem big or small, but usually big, and I'm going to show you that it's man-made. And any problem that is man-made can be fixed. Because man-made, he can fix it. Ain't nothing natural about human behavior that nature made him this way, or nature made him this way. I'm like Plato. <laughs> you born good. Your environment make you asshole. So guess what? Man creates the environment. Nature has nothing to do with that. What nature does, man ain't got shit to do with it. And if the, if the sun come up over there today, it's going to come over there tomorrow. If man has something to do with it, you look up and the sun ain't even there. Because it's a man-made shit. Nature don't need us, and nature ain't made us this way. Your environment made you this way. And it wasn't accidentally. Show me a problem, and I'm gonna show you somebody been benefit from it, and I don't care how many people die. In fact, they would have it no other way. So, people, like the gentleman here, what we can do is free ourselves from government and society, because those are the two that man created for his benefit, not your benefit. If you read a few books like I have, you find out that no man got the answer. If you read Plato and then you go to Aristotle, he doesn't agree with Plato completely, even though he learned from Aristotle. That's natural. If you read Kant and you read uh, David Hume, David Hume said he's a he's uh, that metaphysics is a joke. Kant said, no, no, it's not a joke. I'm going to show you they that have been practicing medicine has been a joke. But what I'm going to show you is not a joke. Well, I got news for you. All I'm trying to say that man is not no God. Man is on his way to Rose Hill. Man don't know no more than you, me, or nobody else. And when he sell you what he wants to sell you, then you're going to get what you get me. And you say, oh, you raise your hand and blah, blah, blah. What can we do? You got to get away from society. You got to get away from the government. And he mentioned something very important here. Uh, have a strong influence here. He mentioned television. But you can, uh, can mention the television. You can mention the books. You can make it even the school. All of those places make you accept the official word. <laughs> And anybody with a pencil and some paper and a vocabulary can write the official version that looks so good and it sounds so good that they can tell you that, oh, this is true. For instance, if you read the classic, you done read Homer and Euripides and, and, and Obed and all of those people. 
that was some shit made up. But you read it, man, you just have to fall in love with it. This is some beautiful stuff. This is creative. And I appreciate that creative. But they didn't pass it off as this is real. Somebody else grabbed it and turned it into the Old Testament and said this is real. Then they said there's somebody behind the cloud. If a man, somebody, a human being, can sell you somebody behind the cloud, he can sell you any shit he wants. that I talk too much, I'm not going to talk now. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, seldom um, am I so uh, inspired by a speaker that comes here. Uh, we've had uh, them come and go. Uh, there have been some good causes that they've espoused, but this is a cause that's uh, very uh, uh, dear to my heart. Uh, certainly there are two independent, uh, semi-independent uh, causes. Uh, one is the uh, um, uh, searching for uh, uh, missing people and um, um, keeping up on cold cases. Uh, um, there are too many uh, people that go missing, and of course, uh, this recent uh, incident of the three women being found in the uh, that house in Cleveland uh, is a is a, a terrible um, uh, shows a terrible uh, situation in our system that um, there's not enough manpower or there's not enough uh, scrutiny done to these cases. And, if the speaker can get an organization together that will do that, that will um, uh, really form an independent database that is um, run by citizens um, that uh, keeps uh, the fire on these cases, uh, trying to find these people that have disappeared. Uh, uh, I, I am so wholeheartedly in uh, support of that. Uh, um, and, and also the, the fact of uh, trying to hold the uh, fire um, on uh, cases of innocence where people have been unjustly convicted. I mean, we know so many horror stories of those. Every time you read one in the newspaper, uh, uh, whether it's the Reader or the Tribune or um, any other uh, newspaper, um, it, it's so clear to malfeasance uh, in our system. And I do mean um, some holding of these people that uh, seem to think that they can just get away with uh, using these jailhouse snitches or using this um, uh, pseudoscience. Uh, as they used to do hair analysis, which was just quite BS. I mean, and now at least thankfully, um, juries have been led to expect DNA evidence, which is a good step in the right direction because at least um, if there is DNA evidence that is collected at a crime scene and uh, it's legitimately collected, not just uh, something where I, I spit on the sidewalk and six weeks later maybe someone's trying to connect me with a crime that happened on that sidewalk. But um, um, legitimate scientific evidence compared to the pseudoscience that's been done and the more recent revelations that um, fingerprints might be to some extent not foolproof as they've been supported uh, to be. Uh, all of these things need to be examined with very fine scrutiny. And uh, to have someone that is dedicating their life to doing that, or a large portion of their life, is a great step in the right direction, and I'm so uh, wholeheartedly in favor of it. Um, another point which I'd like to bring up, uh, which the speaker didn't mention, no one's mentioned it so far, if we had a very small part of the money that's squandered on this ridiculous drug war, uh, this criminal, this criminal behavior of putting people in jail for um, exercising what is just a, a simple right of, you know, using um, uh, a drug that should be their choice, uh, uh, provided that disclaimers are made and, and they're well aware of the, um, the properties that the drug might have um, um, in regard to them. I mean, there's people um, who uh, make choices sometimes to use a drug that's not been approved by the FDA to try to save their lives. And that's another thing, and people should be allowed to do that. If they know all the evidence pro and con about that drug, they should be allowed to do that of their own free will. Um, the same thing goes for something like marijuana. I mean, it is just a scandal that this money is spent to put people in jail for uh, smoking marijuana or taking T THC is that the um, effective ingre ingredient that can prevent uh, nausea in cases of cancer and things like that. A small fraction of the money with a squandered and criminally spent um, by our criminal government 
uh, to put people in jail uh, to support the in a prison industrial complex could easily process all these rape kits that are that are languishing. Okay, thank you very much. It absolutely surprises me. It absolutely surprises me today how you're saying we need more money for law enforcement. That we need more money for better police tactics, that we need more money for this and that and the other thing. When in reality, there has been more money going to law enforcement, security, and a lot of other terrorist preventions in the world. Dana Priest, in her recent book and program that aired on PBS about the size of government, has talked about the black budget and a lot of the areas of growth that our federal government has spent supposedly to keep us safe and to prevent crime. And there's a lot of duplication of databases and law enforcement problems that, that are absolutely unnecessary. Even, for example, a $2 billion data center that the NSA is going to be using that's opening up in Salt Lake City, Utah, that was done in a recent Wired magazine article. That money, if it's taken to the forensic scientists and other areas, could easily solve a lot more problems. It's not that law enforcement doesn't have the money to do things. It isn't that law enforcement doesn't have the resources. It's just that it's not spent properly or properly accounted for because the security hole that a lot of these places have is almost inexhaustible. I happen to know a friend of mine who's a uh, town administrator, and he said the two biggest rat holes where our tax money go into our public safety and fire prevention. And he said it's not that we don't uh, need to spend money on police and fire safety, but he said to upgrade radios that in, in the police cars that are perfectly working well now and are less than five years old, and to replace them with brand new equipment is kind of a little bit crazy. He said. They had older equipment that's like 20 years old that could still get the job done. He said, why not continue to use it? He said the money that was spent on like those radios could have gone into some public programs or some other areas that could have really provided a much better bang for the buck. I like this guy's organization. I think he's doing a great job with what he's wanting to take care of. But I really think that what we really need to do is take a good hard look at the funding of, of law enforcement, at where the priorities are, and if the police functions to keep us safe, it's definitely needed by people out in the streets, more funding or a redirection of funding towards basic crime investigation and tactics, processing these rape kits and doing the basics of police work that have been known to work instead of the newer super analyzed security cameras and other things. London, for example, doesn't have a lot of crime on their metro system anymore because of the surveillance cameras. But what they don't tell you about is about the people behind them, and the response times, and a lot of the basic police and legwork that goes in into keeping a system like that crime free. Or some of the other things around the world that, that are being used in innovative ways for law enforcement. Uh, the threat of terrorism is real, yes. We haven't seen a lot of it here in the city. But I guarantee you, you know, when you, if you go to a concert or something today, you will be frisked and you will be going through some security. And it's just some basic things that, that need to be done to keep the public safe to a large degree. It's too bad that this has to happen. It's too bad that we have a lot of, of, of things that go around like this. But you guys would be the first to, to decry an increase in law enforcement if it affected you personally. For example, you know what we're doing now with the NSA leaks and all the other things, you know? What happened to the privacy of our papers? But yet at the first sign that it could say, oh, it will solve a crime if we had ready access to all this stuff, yeah, it could also mean abuse of power as well. We have enough money in this country to take care of such basic things as law enforcement through basic police work. What we don't can't afford is the fraud, waste, and abuse that occurs in what I call the public safety hole. Thank you. In the
town uh, of Chattanooga, Tennessee, there was a man who sued a hospital. I've forgotten the man's name. But he, he accused the hospital of destroying his wife's uh, sex drive. The hospital responded by pointing out that his wife had been treated by an ophthalmologist and uh, they corrected her vision. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let us again. I want to thank our speaker. Thank you very much tonight. She put on a lot of time and effort, I know, on the PowerPoint. Nice seeing you, Dad, and I hope you enjoy your visit. I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. I won't pick too much on Texas. <laughs> <laughs> They've got their own concept of justice, <laughs> unique among the states, I guess. Uh, let's see here. Uh, you know, there's, there's an enormous amount of media attention given to the amount of crime uh, and that our political authorities are expected to address. Uh, it's always a campaign issue. <laughs> on the other side, we've actually had two speakers here on the increasingly enormous number of people who have been incarcerated and put in jail in the United States. I believe the prison population exceeds 10 million. Uh, I actually scheduled a speaker when the prison population was only at five million. And that was considered giving an evening to. Now it's at least 10 and growing. Um, and apparently we have more people incarcerated than per capita basis than any place else on earth. Um, this certainly is a central issue in our society. I'm, you're going to have a little difficulty in your organization. Is your organization to put people in jail or to get them out of jail? Um, you're going to have to flip either way there. Uh, David, I have to disagree with you. If you think non-government law enforcement entities or bodies are so wonderful that I guess you kind of like the Ku Klux Klan, which didn't come under the influence of the government, or the vigilante mobs and things of that nature. No. The one place where you really have got to turn and look for, and that the society has to have, is the government that is, has some semblance of fairness and equitability in the application of its laws. Um, certainly, I support financially various law influential or related type organizations, um, but to say that they can operate outside the law, quite frankly, is nonsensical and a dangerous concept. Uh, private organizations are certainly, are open to more influence than the government. Um, crime, in my own little world of labor law, a criminal activity is, really raises the issue. So, I mean, there's all kinds of things that go on in life, but if there's a, a, a criminal activity, it suddenly is of a much higher level, uh, things like that. Justice, he kind of talked about it. It's been discussed by the philosoph among the philosophers and the philosophical community going back to Socrates and his own trial. Um, it was recommended reading for anyone. Um, the other thing I'd like to talk about, um, we have an old college attendee, Mike Woloshin, you'd remember him. Yeah. At least a day does not pass in my life, 
that I get no less than three, more like five to seven emails <laughs> regarding intrusion on privacy. Yeah. <laughs> now, yes, there is a delicate balance there, the intrusion upon our privacy with cameras and so forth. I also believe that they're used in the application of justice and the apprehension of criminals and things like that. I don't know where we're going to go like that. Anyhow, I have good luck with your organization, and Frank, really, as I discussed earlier this evening, it's, it's clear that the moment we took prayer out of school, the crime rate went up in the United States. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you very much. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. That's a nice trade. Yeah. I want to thank our speaker and his dad uh, for coming and uh, That's his dad? themselves uh, to the, no. the barbs and uh, questions of, uh, of the college. And uh, I, I, what I was impressed with was the long list of good causes uh, that uh, he, uh, he and his organization uh, uh, are atten attempting to address. I, I wonder if they uh, are not going to spread themselves a little too thin. It gets a little hard to do everything, uh, especially uh, when you're faced with uh, crime and, and uh, the courts and uh, with uh, the victims of crime. Um, well, uh, I want to thank him. I think uh, we should all uh, keep in touch. I hope that we will hear more in the future uh, about his organization and uh, what they are doing. Uh, Charlie, take note. Where are you, Charlie? He's outside having a smoke. Okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I should join them. All right. Uh, so, uh, without any further ado, unless there's somebody else who wants to give a rebuttal, uh, I will... Speaker gets the last word. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Again, I just want to say I'm very honored um, to be here. And all the uh, rebuttals that you guys gave to me, very valid points. I am going to look into all of them. So before I leave, I do want to uh, get a couple cards and, and share information so I can call you guys later on and help me. I, I'm going to need your help. But I do promise you this, that I will dedicate um, my time, my life, and you know, to have my dad here with me and, and my family's understanding that this is what we should do. Um, I'm never going to give up. I want to come back here actually. I want you to book you know, on July 20th, 2014, so I can come right back here. That's the kind of guy I am. You know, I, I want to be right back here so I can uh, tell you guys what I've learned from you and what I've been learning all year. And God bless you. Yeah. Hey. And on that note, I know everybody that got up. Somehow, they equivalent that to this organization solving all the ills and corruption in the police department society. <laughs> no, that's not what we plan on doing. What we plan on doing really is helping victims and working in the organization, helping, helping to put pressure on the forensic departments, uh, looking at files that are, the, the departments are overwhelmed. They, they have too much, there's so much crime. And just take, if we can help one case and one family then that's what we're going to do. We, we, we're not going to be able to solve all it, and we can't go, got to put pressure on the police. We're not going to get money from the government so we can do this or that. But if you have individuals like yourself, just put put the attention there. That's what it is, just the attention. So, uh, I, you know, I just want to, you know, the police department has always been corrupt. And cold case file is not going to corrupt. Uh, this always laziness in politics. This organization is not going to stop that. But we can make a difference in one victim's family. Then you have been to change the course of the world. That's the way we see it. Okay?
I'm, I'm grateful to be here too. And that's a wrap. Thank you all for coming. Should you still be here? See you again soon.